carry on with the uh, suttas uh, where we left off yesterday. So I will share the screen with you once more. Um, Okay, so uh, here we are. So um, just uh, to remind you, we are looking at the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, this um, Sutta about meditation practice. Uh, and uh, we have been looking at the four Satipatthanas so far. We have been looking at the first three. Now we're looking at the fourth one called Dhamma Nupassana translated here as the observation of principles. And the idea is to understand the nature of causality. Why is it that certain qualities arise? Uh, and uh, why is it that other qualities do not arise? And uh, I pointed out yesterday that the two main aspects of the contemplation of Dhamma is the observation of the five hindrances, uh, and then the observation of the seven factors of awakening. But uh, there are also a few other exercises, if you like, as part of the Dhamma Nupassana. One of them is the contemplation of the five aggregates. It only exists in the Pali, not in the other sources. Uh, but let's just have a quick look at it anyway, since we are here, uh, just to go through it. Uh, so this is what's coming up next here. So this is how it is described in the Satipatthana Sutta and also elsewhere in the suttas as well. So furthermore, a monastic meditates, or anyone really, meditates by observing an aspect of principles with respect to the five grasping aggregates. And how does a mendicant meditate observing an aspect of principles with respect to the five grasping aggregates. It is when a mendicant contemplates such is form, such is the origin of form, such is the ending of form, such is feeling, such is the origin of feeling, such is the ending of feeling, such is perception, such is the origin of perception, such is the ending of perception. Such are choices, uh, such is the origin of choices, uh, just, such is the ending of choices, uh, such is consciousness, uh, such is the origin of consciousness, uh, such is the ending of consciousness. Uh, so, um, what exactly are these five aggregates? And the five aggregates are just really your experience. Yeah, right now you are experiencing the five aggregates. Uh, there is a feeling related to the experience right now. There is an aspect of form because your body is there. You can see the body, you can feel it. Uh, there is an aspect of perception. Yeah, you are, uh, you are perceiving what is going on in a certain way. Uh, yeah, the uh, seeing the suttas, uh, um, hearing the talk and these kind of things. Uh, it's perception. We make sense out of what is going on through perception. There is a choice, the choice is the choice to attend to what is going on. And then there's the consciousness, which is the awareness behind everything to know that things are happening here. So the five aggregates are really quite straightforward in this sense. They're just the experience that we have moment to moment, yeah? During ordinary life or during meditation or really at any time at all. So you can see here that the contemplation of these aggregates comes towards the end of the path, yeah, towards the end of the practice, because this is where we kind of uncover the nature of these five aggregates. The reason why the Buddha divides the experience up in this way is because this is where we tend to have a sense of self in regard to our experience. And because this is where we tend to have a sense of self, and one of the purposes of meditation and insight is to kind of uproot this idea of a self, to see it as an illusion, to see it as something that has no real reference in reality. It doesn't refer to anything that exists. So this is where that sense of self tends to, uh, tends to uh, you, you find it in these areas. Uh, and this is why we contemplate these things in this way. Uh. 
Um, I will show you in more detail later on how we can do this contemplation. I will show that once we come to the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing. Uh, but uh, uh, the main idea here is to understand what form is, how we experience that, uh, and then to see how the form comes into being, yeah? how it originates uh, and how it ends. And all of these things can actually be experienced in your meditation, at least temporarily, at least uh, to some extent, uh, even straight away as we do the mindfulness of breathing. And then later on, it becomes even more profound uh, as you see this uh, as a real insight into things like dependent origination. Uh, so I will leave that aside for now, because otherwise we're going to uh, take too long. We'll come back to this later on. Uh, and so you meditate, observing uh, the aggregates internally, externally, etc. That is how a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of principles uh, with regard to the five aggregates. Uh, then we come to the sense fields. Uh, yeah, and again, this is not a uh, core aspect of the Dhamma Nupassana. It is not, uh, uh, but it is still uh, interesting. So let's have a quick look at how the sense fields are contemplated in this way. Yeah. Furthermore, a mendicant meditates by observing or contemplating an aspect of principles uh, with respect to the six interior and exterior sense fields. Uh. And how does a mendicant meditate uh, in this way? Yeah? It is when a mendicant understands the eye, the sight, uh, and the fetter that arises depending on both of these. Uh. They understand how the fetter that has not arisen comes to arise, uh, how the arisen fetter comes to be abandoned, uh, and how the abandoned fetter comes to not arise again in the future. Uh. So you hear, you understand uh, uh, the eye uh, and sights, uh, yeah, so you understand that entire world, you understand the limitations of that world, you understand that it is only has such a, such a potential, the potential stops at a certain point. Yeah? And in other words, by understanding the limitations, you understand sort of the degree of happiness you can expect by seeing things. And then also the degree of suffering or problems that arises with the eye and sights. The eye and sights are not really entirely separate. Yeah? The eye and sights are very closely related to each other. Uh, whenever we have an experience through the eye, we see things, uh, there's always the eye and sights kind of arise together. Uh, yeah? So you, uh, they arise together. And when they do, there's also consciousness present as well. Uh, and that's when we have an experience of seeing something. Uh. And then you have the idea of the factor that arises independent of these. Uh, and the idea of the factor is just that when you see something that you enjoy, yeah, the, then, of course, you tend to like that thing, and then you get attached to those things. And this is kind of how these fetters arise in the world, when we enjoy things through the eyes. And the reason why the factor arises again is because we don't see the downside of seeing. We don't see its limitations. We don't see its impermanence. We don't see how stressful it can be to always have these six senses operating in us. Uh, yeah, the eye, the sense of sight is actually very, it takes up a lot of uh, mental capacity. Uh, yeah, sometimes if you feel tired, you close your eyes. Uh, yeah, this is why we close our eyes also when we sleep at night, or even if you're just tired, you may close your eyes. Uh, because by closing your eyes, you're shutting out a large disturbance coming from the world. Uh, so one way of thinking about the idea of sights is actually as a disturbance, something that takes up a very large amount of mental capacity. And when you shut it out, you tend to feel more peaceful. Yeah, so this is how you can see the factor that arises, but then you see the, uh, how you abandon that factor because you understand the downside of the factor in this case. And part of the factor here is also, as I mentioned yesterday, is actually the being factored to the eye itself. Uh, the very fact of seeing, you are attached to the idea of seeing. Uh, and that also is a problem because if you have too much strong attachment to the idea of seeing, uh, 
then again, you will only be able to take your meditation so far. And it will stop at a certain point because you have to abandon the very fact of being able to see to go really deeply into meditation. Yeah, so you uh, understand how the unarisen factor arises, uh, how the arisen factor comes to be abandoned, uh, yeah, by seeing the downside of this, uh, and how the abandoned factor comes not to arise again in the future. And that is when you fully understand this and then you abandon uh, the craving for this. Uh, let's just stop there because I don't want to go too much into detail uh, on this. Uh, this is all a uh, uh, good, these are all important things, uh, but this is at the, at the very end of the path, usually after we have attained the samadhi. So I still want to talk a little bit more about the attainment of samadhi and how we get to, to there, because that is really the critical part. Uh, the insight then often tend to happen as a matter of course. Uh, so then this is how you abandon the factor in relation to the eye and sights. Uh, and then you do the same in regard to the other senses. So you understand the ear, the sounds, and the factor that arises depending on these things. You understand the nose and the smell and the factor that arises independent of those things. You understand the tongue, the tastes, and the factor that arises independent of this. You understand the body and the things that you touch, the touches and the factor that arises dependent uh, on these two things. Uh, and then you understand the mind and the thoughts. Thoughts here are Dhamma. These are just the mental content, anything we are aware of in the mind. Uh, and the factor that arises independent on both of these. Uh, and you understand how the factor that has not arisen comes to arise. Uh, how the arisen factor comes to be abandoned uh, and how the abandoned factor comes to not arise again in the future. So the same idea with the mind. Uh, the most important thing is to abandon the five hindrances uh, because this is what stops you from uh, attaining going into deep samadhi. But ultimately, you have to get rid of the factor in regard to all the six senses, uh, regardless of your mental content, uh, regardless of what these things are about. Uh. So um, you will notice here that it, it is not the sense itself that it is the problem. It is not the object of the sense itself that is the problem. It is okay to see, it is okay to have sights. The problem is the attachment and the craving that arises independent on those things. And the attachment and the craving are different from the actual sense. So you can still see, you can still enjoy sights, but uh, you can abandon that attachment uh, that relates to both of them. So that is the six senses in brief. And now we come to the part which I think is more important uh, because it is about uh, the, the, um, uh, what I consider the original part of the Satipatthana Sutta. And the thing that goes most likely is goes all the way back to the time of the Buddha and has, uh, it has more claim to being an authentic part of the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is the observation of the awakening factors. These are the Sambhojangas, yeah, the Satta Sambhojangas, the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. So this is what the Buddha has to say. Yeah. Furthermore, a mendicant meditates, a monastic med meditates uh, by observing an aspect of Dhamma principles uh, in relation to the seven awakening factors. And how does a mendicant do this? It is when a monastic or a lay person or anyone for that matter, who has the awakening factor of mindfulness and understands I have the awakening factor of mindfulness in me. When they don't have the awakening factor of mindfulness in them, they understand I don't have the awakening factor of mindfulness in me. They understand how the awakening factor of mindfulness that has not arisen comes to arise and how the awakening factor of mindfulness that has arisen becomes fulfilled by development. So uh, again, uh, you can see here, it always starts off by knowing the thing that we're trying to understand, yeah, you know that you have the factor of mindfulness or you know you don't have it. And uh, so you, you, 
you develop these things and you become aware of what it actually means to be truly mindful. Huh? And uh, to be an awakening factor of mindfulness, uh, it has to be a strong mindfulness. Yeah? It has to be the mindfulness that we develop that arises out of Satipatthana meditation, uh, even stronger than what you need for Satipatthana probably, uh, for it to really lead to deep samadhi. But at the very least, the same kind of mindfulness uh, that we have uh, when we do Satipatthana meditation. Uh, yeah, it is the foundation of the path. We understand what it means to be truly mindful when the mind is clear, uh, when the mind is fairly peaceful, there's not too much thinking going on. Uh, if there's a lot of thinking going on, it usually means that there is an underlying craving that takes you out of the present. Uh, so there is clarity and there is presence. And these are two of the main characteristics of mindfulness is clarity and presence of mind. So you know whether this is really there, you know if it is really strong, yeah? you know the various degrees to which there are mindfulness. And you will notice that mindfulness always increases as your meditation improves, as you gain more insight into the path, mindfulness actually becomes stronger. There is a minimum mindfulness required to meditate, but beyond that min minimum mindfulness, uh, there is a continuous improvement until basically you become fully awakened. And when you become the Arahant, uh, that is when it reaches its maximum strength. Uh, or you can say it reaches its ma maximum strength uh, in the jhanas themselves, like the fourth jhana or something. Uh. And then you know, so you know how to. Uh, the limitations of the mindfulness factor, you know exactly what, uh, how, how it works, what it means, uh, and then you know how it arises, yeah? how it comes to be. Yeah? So how does it come to be? And this is one, in a sense, what we have been discussing throughout this course, uh, how to be mindful. Yeah? And uh, the simple answer to that question is, well, really, the way to be mindful is to practice the first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. We have been talking about right view to quite some extent, and even more important, perhaps, or just as important, is the idea of sila, the idea of kindness, the idea of morality. And it's very important to understand it when we talk about morality in Buddhism, when we talk about sila, when we talk about kindness, it is a very profound thing, yeah? And when we talk about that, if you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, you have first right view, then you have right intention, and the next four factors, yeah, half of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are all about sila. Half of the path is about sila. And I think that says something about the importance of this factor. Yeah, this is where a lot of the effort has to be put in actually practicing sila. We think sila is obvious. We think sila is the five precepts. We think sila is something that we can do quite easily. But that is a misunderstanding of sila. Sila is very profound. It only becomes fully perfected when you become a stream enter. And even then, it is not 100% pure. That full purity comes later on when you are an anagami or even an arahant. So it's actually very profound. And it has to do with our whole attitude to the world, how we perceive other people, how we think about others, and all of these things are part of this. And unless you purify this to a high degree, your mindfulness will always be a little bit not powerful enough to really be a factor that leads you to samadhi, that leads you to the very deep states of meditation. So you become more aware of the importance of all of these things. If you really want your meditation to work, that is what you have to do. This is where you, uh, the possibility of gaining strong mindfulness actually lies. So make sure that that sila is empowered to the maximum way. Then meditation becomes possible or mindfulness becomes possible, which means meditation becomes possible. So that is, um, how we have to practice in the long term, yeah? And in the short term, if you are just kind of within a single meditation, well, within, within a single meditation, it is often just a, a matter of allowing the mind to relax, yeah? Letting go of the world a little bit, bringing in some ideas of just 
recollecting some positive things yeah and uh, remembering a bit of right view and then allowing your mind to become mindful based on that yeah? but your ability to do that in a single meditation will depend on how you have developed your mind throughout the day for a year for all those years in advance all of that comes together in the single meditation all that development over all that time that is where it becomes kind of critical so this is how mindfulness arises yeah and um, uh, so uh, i think it is a place where people often go wrong and this is why i emphasize this so much because um, some people have good mindfulness already but I think a lot of people that don't really understand properly how to give rise to mindfulness. It is not by just watching the breath that you become more mindful. Huh? Yeah, very often you don't, it doesn't really work. You just are just tired or your mind is dull or whatever. Huh? And it comes back to this thing I was talking about before, this lady yeah, who I heard about recently, someone else was telling me this story, this lady who had been meditating for years and years. Huh? And she had been given, she had given up watching television because television was like a nuisance in her life for meditation. Then after years and years of meditating, she started watching television again and she got addicted to television just like that. And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And the, the reason, of course, is that she had not been developing the other factors of the path, yeah? the other factors that stop you from getting addicted to things in the world, the kindness. And when you don't develop those, then there is a limit to what meditation can do for you. Even if you meditate for 10 years, actually, it doesn't change you all that much because it has to come together with the other factors of the path. So you understand how the mindfulness factor arises, and then you understand how the mindfulness factor becomes fulfilled by development. That's the last part there. And the fulfillment by development is by then you, once you have the basic mindfulness, well, that is when you can do the meditation. That's when you watch the breath. Yeah? That is when you sit back and you allow the breath to develop because you have the basic factors in place. And then you continue to practice the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And when all of these factors come together, when you develop all of these things together, then the mindfulness gradually improves as well through the meditation, through the um, co continuous development of the other factors uh, of the path. So um, this is the basic idea of developing the factors of awakening here. What we are looking at now, when we are looking at the factors of awakening here, what we essentially we are doing is we are seeing how starting with mindfulness, what happens when you have mindfulness, and then how that mindfulness transforms into samadhi. How do we bridge that gap between mindfulness and samadhi, between mindfulness and stillness? This is what this is about. And this is about all the factors that how the mind gradually changes from mindfulness, all of those qualities of mind that we have to build up that end up in samadhi. This is the purpose of the seven factors of awakening. So let us have a, let us go a little bit further with this. So uh, then you have the other factors of awakening here. Yeah, you have the factor awakening of investigation of principles, yeah, the Dhamma Vichaya factor of awakening, yeah. you have the energy factor of awakening, yeah. you have the rapture fa factor of awakening, energy is the Virya, rapture is the PT yeah, that we have on this path. Yeah. And uh, you can see here how we are building up the qualities of the mind. And the idea here is to develop these qualities, uh, all leading to Samadhi, leading to stillness eventually. Yeah. So investigation of principles, what is this all about? And what this is about, remember what we're doing here is we are watching the breath, we're doing Satipatthana practice. And as we do Satipatthana practice, we have to overcome all the hindrances. Yeah? We have just looked at the five hindrances before. And so the investigation of principles is really very similar to that. It is similar to that in a sense, it is about understanding what are the good qualities of mind? What are the bad qualities of mind? 
What are the wholesome qualities of mind? What are the unwholesome qualities of mind? What are the blameworthy qualities of mind? What are the blameless qualities of mind? What are the bright qualities of mind? What are the dark qualities of mind? So we, we start to understand the various qualities of mind, what it is that leads towards uh, deeper samadhi, deeper meditation, and what it, it is that it's away from deeper samadhi and deeper meditation. This is what this is about. So we investigate the mind, dhamma, vichya. Vichya means investigation or examination and then understanding these qualities in the mind. So how does this factor arise? Well, this factor arises simply by doing meditation and then investigating a little bit. And you will have noticed that one of the things that I do at the end of the meditation is always to ask the question, well, why did the meditation work? Or why did it not work? Yeah? So you investigate a little bit about what's happening in your meditation. And then when you look back, you will see, well, what are the good qualities? What are the bad qualities? How do they come to be? What is it that I, how do I pay attention to these things? What are the things that I establish in the mind? What is the perception I use that actually makes the meditation work? How do I let go? What does it mean to let go? It just means to relax or something like that. These are very simple things, yeah? But uh, sometimes you need to investigate a little bit to actually see it. And then these things arise out of that. This is how you overcome doubt. You come to understand what are the good qualities and what are the bad qualities of the mind. So the arising of the investigation of these things and then how you fulfill it by keeping on investigating, investigating all the way until you reach samadhi. And that is when you know finally, fully, what are the good qualities and what are the bad ones. Only when you come to samadhi do you know that fully. So you develop the awakening factor of investigation of principles. So let's... Uh, Carry on, so I will bring up the, uh, the screen again. And uh, so here we are. So we are looking at the factors of awakening and we're looking at uh, how they arise, how they come about. And so here the next one is the energy factor of awakening. Yeah? And again, we have to understand this in the same way. You have to know what it means to have the energy factor of awakening. You know what it means when it is absent you know how it arises and how it becomes fulfilled. And the energy factor of awakening, well, that is the energy of the mind. It is not effort. It is different from effort. Energy is the natural energy. Even if you are completely relaxed, yeah, the energy is there in the mind. The mind is naturally energetic. And that energy can become stronger and stronger the deeper your samadhi is, the, deep, the further on you are on the path, uh, the more powerful that energy of the mind can be. Uh, yeah? So this is, um, uh, this is something, again, that you experience. The, the more meditation you do, you tend to understand what this, uh, the idea of energy in the mind actually means. And I'm sure all of you have some idea what it means. Uh, it is that natural inspiration of the mind, when the mind is energized, yeah? And you, it's easy to apply the mind because of the energy inside. You don't have to force yourself. You don't have to apply yourself very hard. The energy is there. The opposite of energy is when the mind is kind of dull and uh, drowsy and lethargic and all of these kind of things. That is opposite of energy, yeah? So um, you understand the energy, you understand what gives rise to the energy of the mind. And what gives rise to the energy of the mind is, well, first of all, some degree of application. You have to apply yourself to some extent initially. And then as you apply yourself, eventually the energy starts to arise if you apply yourself in the right way. Another way that energy arises is because you are inspired by something. Inspiration is very closely related to the idea of energy. Yeah? So if you are able to inspire yourself by you know, the fact that you have all these kalyanamittas in your life, uh, you inspire yourself by uh, reflecting that you are so fortunate to have the Dhamma in your life, uh, you inspire yourself by just by looking at your conduct, you think, yeah, well, actually, I'm really happy with my conduct. I'm living much, much better now. Uh, 
or you inspire yourself by some kind of action that you have done in the past uh, or whatever it is, but it has to be a spiritual inspiration, not an inspiration that comes from worldly things. It has to be related to the spirituality in a certain way. Yeah? Um, uh, that energy that comes from that, uh, that is what we mean. And that is how you develop that energy by reflecting on those things in the right way. Yeah? And I'm going to have a look at the sutta later on that talks a bit about the six kind of reflections that we can do huh? that give rise to energy. Yeah? And they also give rise to rapture. Rapture is the next factor here. So the things that give rise to rapture and energy are very similar. Yeah, they are about inspiring yourself and reflecting on the spiritual aspects of the path that are inspirational and joyful on the path. And then you keep on practicing in this way. You keep on just following the breath and deepening your meditation. The initial way to start the energy and the rapture is then to reflect on something inspiring, but then eventually you just come back to the breath. And then when you come back to the breath, these factors develop as you develop the breath meditation. Energy and rapture become stronger as a consequence. And this is how eventually they develop all the way to fulfillment, yeah? taking them all the way to the end of the path. Then you have the awakening factors of uh, tranquility, uh, which is the next one. Uh, and uh, uh, these factors are now becoming very profound factors. Yeah? Now we are talking about very profound states of mind. Uh, and for the most part, the awakening factor of tranquility just happens as you keep on developing your meditation. So you learn how to meditate properly. Uh, you learn how to let go, you learn not to control your meditation, you learn how to withdraw the will. The will is the enemy of tranquility. The doing of the meditation, the agency that we have in meditation is the enemy of tranquility. So it's the ability just to stand back and to allow the process to happen. And this is getting quite easy at this point, yeah, because you already have energy, you already have a rapture, so you don't really need to do very much at all. In fact, standing back, allowing the process to happen becomes easier the deeper your meditation is already. Yeah? So you allow the process to tranquilize, yeah? You just stay with the meditation object, you stay with the breath, you stay with the rapture that is already there, and then the thing just develops, you naturally start to feel tranquility and peace and calm and all of these beautiful qualities within her. So this is how you develop this particular factor. You also understand what tranquility means, yeah? And you understand that the tranquility that we have in ordinary life is actually very poor compared to the tranquility that you can achieve in meditation practice. You can achieve very profound states of tranquility yeah? where the mind is completely unified, uh, where there is no movement at all. All there is is brightness, energy, rapture, without any kind of movement. Uh, the mind is almost perfectly still. Even when you come to these earlier stages of the meditation, when there is rapture, and maybe when the nimitta arises in your practice, uh, already the tranquility is going to be very powerful at this point. Uh, so you understand the various depths of tranquility and you understand how powerful it can become. Yeah, this is understanding the, the phenomenon uh, and then developing the phenomenon by allowing the meditation to develop uh, as a consequence. Uh, and then, of course, you have the immersion or the samadhi or the stillness. Uh, personally, I prefer the, rapture, the idea of stillness. Uh, it's a nice way of thinking about uh, the idea of samadhi. So from that tranquility, from the peace of the mind, eventually you attain stillness. Stillness means that there is no movement anymore. And that stillness, stillness you know, is the, there are degrees of stillness, just like there are degrees of tranquility. But stillness is a more profound idea here than tranquility. It is the complete immersion where you are completely within the object. Yeah, that is... A, uh, that you are watching or completely within that experience itself. Uh, and uh, that tranquility, the immersion, uh, why does it happen? It happens because you develop the meditation even further. 
Yeah, you allow the meditation to happen. You don't do anything at all. Uh, and then you uh, just uh, eventually, uh, one day, when you let go enough, uh, then the samadhi becomes complete. Uh, and there is no movement of the mind at all anymore as a consequence of that. Uh, so all of these things are things that you allow to happen in the mind. Uh, you just stand back, you watch. Uh, and if there are certain very refined hindrances, then you understand how to overcome those very refined hindrances. Uh, and then the process uh, uh, takes on a new power and a new kind of um, uh, effect because you overcome these problems that block you from getting there. And at this point in your meditation, it is very, very automatic. Yeah, It is so powerful, it is so attractive that you are drawn into the meditation because you are drawn into the meditation. That is why it becomes very automatic. Nothing really you have to do at this particular point. And then when you practice that immersion even further, you take it ultimately all the way to the pinnacle of the Noble Eightfold Path. And that is the equanimity. Yeah, the equanimity is where you come into the very, very, very deep states of meditation, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, and these kind of things. And the equanimity just really means that the mind is perfectly balanced. Yeah, there is the, the mind doesn't really uh, have any predilections. It has very little, uh, it has very little um, inclination one way or the other. It is very, very evenly balanced. And the reason why this happens at this point is because you have gone beyond good and bad feelings. This is the point where there's only neutral feeling left. And because there's only neutral feeling left, it means that all the feelings of the world, which usually are happy feelings and painful feelings, are completely left behind. And at that point, the mind becomes incredibly equanimous. So this is a very high degree of equanimity. And I think it is impossible to really understand what this actually means until you achieve it. The equanimity that we have in daily life is very useful. Yeah, don't underestimate that equanimity when the mind is not drawn in by the pleasures of the world. But even though it is useful, it is a very poor quality compared to the equanimity that you achieve when you achieve very, very profound states of samadhi. So really you have to get there. You can get some idea of what it means, yeah? It means the mind that looks on. Uh, upeka is the Pali word. It literally means to look on. You're able to look on with a perfectly poised and balanced mind, uh, not being attracted to anything, not being repelled by anything. You can take things in exactly as they are because the mind is in perfect balance. Uh, that is really what it means. Uh, so you understand what this factor of equanimity, when you have it in you, you know that it is there. Yeah, you understand the full meaning of this. When it is absent, you know that it is absent. And then you know how it develops through this process of uh, samadhi, coming to the very completion of samadhi at the very end. And then you know how you fulfill it by development. And it is fulfilled usually in the fourth jhana, or you can say it is its real fulfillment, of course, is also at the very end of the path when we come to the, uh, when you become an arahant and these kind of things. That is a very final fulfillment of these things. So that is the seven factors of awakening in brief. And to a very large extent, these tend to unfold just within the meditation experience. That is where they happen. Yeah? Sometimes you can, they can happen a little bit in daily life. Suddenly you feel a bit of joy in daily life. And that can be like a, a, a sign yeah, that these, these factors are being developed. But usually these things happen within the meditation practice, especially the deeper aspects, the tranquility, the samadhi and the equanimity, of course. So uh, let's move on. And then it says that you observe an aspect internally, externally, and both internally, externally. So this is about understanding that these are universal principles that happen to all beings. And then you have the liability to originate, vanish, and originate and vanish. Well, we have really seen that already, especially the arising side of this, whether you have them or not. So it's a bit redundant to see it again. 
And then you have the mindfulness is established that these principles, these dhammas exist to the extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness. So this usually means, in my understanding, that there is a degree of knowledge and mindfulness, but that you are still developing it further. And eventually you meditate independent, not grasping at anything in the world. And this is where you are fully developing these things because they can only fully be developed by non-grasping. As long as you are grasping, it is as if you have a vested interest in things and then you will not be able to go beyond those things. And that is why your meditation will stop or will be limited by that grasping. And that is how a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of principles with respect to the seven awakening factors. So that is uh, uh, the most important one, together with the five uh, hindrances uh, yeah, on this, uh, in, as part of the Dhamma Nupassana. Uh, and the, now we can come to the very last one. The last one is the contemplation of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, so have a, let's have a quick look at that one, even though uh, it is quite clearly not part of the <coughs> original sutta, it is still worth having a quick look at. Uh, so let's see what it says about the Four Noble Truths. So the truths. Furthermore, a mendicant meditates, a monastic mendicates, and anyone meditates by observing or contemplating an aspect of principles with respect to the Four Noble Truths. And how does a mendicant meditate observing an aspect of principles with respect to the Four Noble Truths? It is when a mendicant truly understands that this is suffering. They truly understand this is the origin of suffering. They truly understand this is the cessation of suffering. They truly understand this is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. So um, this is a very advanced stage of meditation. Yeah, because what we are really seeing here, truly understanding the Four Noble Truths, well, actually, it is only the stream entry who does that. So what we are really talking about here is stream entry. That's really what this means. Yeah? So if you truly understand these things fully in this way, actually, we're talking about the insight into stream entry itself. Of course, you can understand these things to a slightly lesser extent and that is what the right view we have been talking about all the way through is about the right view of understanding the difference between suffering and happiness on the path and as you do that you are in a sense approaching a little bit the idea of the four noble truths that's how we can do that in ordinary our ordinary understanding here but the way it is described here it is really described as stream entry itself and stream entry itself, again, is really a result of the satipatthana, as a result of samadhi. That's where you become a stream entry in this way. So uh, uh, let's just carry on and then just uh, finish off this. I'm not going to talk more about stream entry because uh, uh, that comes at the very end. So uh, let's just uh, finish off the sutta. And so they meditate, observing an aspect of principles again, internally, externally, both internally and externally. Yeah, the idea of suffering as a universal truth uh, applicable to all beings, uh, and the same thing with the other Four Noble Truths. Uh, they meditate uh, again, uh, observing the principles as liable to originate, vanish, and both originate and vanish. Uh, or mindfulness is established that these principles exist. Uh, to the extent necessary for just an, an, as, an a degree of knowledge and mindfulness. Uh, they meditate independent, uh, not grasping at anything in the world. Uh, that is how a mendicant meditates uh, by observing an aspect of principles uh, with respect to the four noble truths. Uh, and now comes uh, the more concluding parts uh, of this sutta. Uh, Anyone who develops these four kinds of mindfulness meditation in this way for seven years can expect one of two results. Enlightenment in the present life 
or if there is something remaining here, yeah, non-returning here. Yeah. yeah, so the idea here is if you practice this mindfulness meditation, which is really just mindfulness of breathing, as we shall see later on, uh, it takes you all the way to the end of the path. Uh, yeah. And this is because it includes the samadhi experience, as, as we have seen before. Uh, and it says here you can do it in seven years yeah which is uh, okay that's kind of interesting it's a one of these kind of conundrums so why exactly is it seven years what what about what about, what about any other number what about eight years what about why is seven mentioned in this way here yeah. so let's just read through the, the i'm not going to talk about this very much because it is kind of a bit of a side issue but maybe mention it very briefly here yeah. Then the Buddha says, well, let alone seven years, anyone who develops these four kinds of mindfulness meditation in this way for six years, five years, four years, three years, two years, one year, and then seven months. What happened to 11 months? Okay, never mind. Seven months, six months, five months, four months, three months, two months, one month. A fortnight, let alone a fortnight, anyone who develops these four kinds of meditation in this way for seven days can, be, can expect one of two results, enlightenment in the present life, or if there is something left over, non-returning. So um, the idea here uh, with all of this, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of not entirely clear why the Buddha is saying this. I guess the idea, it is an encouragement, yeah? And the idea is that if you really practice these things, it can happen quite fast. Why is there so, why does he say this in so many different ways? And the idea here is, well, it depends on what the qualities you come in to the practice with. If you bring with you a lot of really good qualities, maybe you already have a samadhi, well, then it can happen very fast, yeah? It can maybe even happen in seven days. If you already have the fourth jhana and you practice this, boy, it can probably happen very, very quickly, yeah? But if you are a more ordinary person, it's going to take longer, yeah? Even seven years sounds really kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, optimistic if you are kind of a beginner to the path, uh, yeah? Unless you assume that anyone who comes to this practice has already developed the six factors, maybe that's part of the assumption. So if the six factors, the first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, if they are already purified, well, then maybe seven years is more kind of a, a reasonable guesstimate. So this is, I think, what's going on here. It depends on the, the degree of development that you have, how long it is going to take. But uh, I think in truth that this kind of this part of the sutta is probably not original. Those who have studied the sutta, they argue that this does not belong to the very earliest part of the sutta. It is something that has kind, kind of come down later on as an encouragement, as something to kind of get us going, that this can actually be done yeah, fairly quickly if you put your mind to it in the right way. Yeah. So... Um, uh, I don't think it is to be taken in any literal way. It just means that there is a, this really works really fast and really well if you put your mind to it. But one of, the, one of the reasons why I say this, one of the things that is quite interesting about this, this thing here are the numbers. The numbers are actually quite strange. It starts off by seven years. It goes down to one year, then it goes to seven months. And it goes down to one month, and then it goes down to seven days. Yeah, this number seven seems to be really critical here for some reason. What is this number seven doing here? Now, if you go to some of the other parallel version, for example, if you go to the Sarvastivadin version, it actually is a bit different because it has 11 months, 10 months, all the way down to one month. And then it goes down to seven days, and then it goes from seven days, from six, all the way down to one day. So in according to the Sarvastivadin version, you can become enlightened in one day. So I guess if you have... Everything is ready, yeah, you're, or maybe you're already a stream entry, you already have the four jhanas or whatever, maybe enlightenment can happen in one day, that's kind of the idea. But in the Theravada version, the number seven is very prominent. So what is going on here? And I think that what is going on is that 
this has been pointed out by others, that the number seven has a very strong symbolic effect. Number seven is used throughout human history as a number which means unity, it means completeness. It has like a spiritual significance. So when people who are used to these kind of spiritual ideas, and they would have been more common perhaps in the ancient world than they are today, when they hear the number seven, it actually has the spiritual significance of completeness, of fulfillment of the path, yeah? or practicing it all the way to the end. So it has a symbolic and additional meaning to the literal meaning, which is a symbolic meaning. And that, of course, adds to the feeling of the sutta. It adds to the ambience, it adds to the kind of the inspiration almost, especially if these numbers have a meaning to you as they may, may, have, may have had in the ancient times. So this is where the idea of a little bit of like mythology almost, yeah, the idea of numerology, the significance of numbers are almost brought into the Satipatthana Sutta in this way. I just thought I would mention that because it is kind of strange how this is comes, why it is expressed in this particular way. But really, it doesn't matter so much. I think this last part here probably is some kind of addition that may have happened fairly soon after the time of the Buddha. It may not be original. It does, it's not really all that important. Just a little bit of sidetrack. Sometimes we have to talk about things that are a little bit different uh, just to kind of make, make it more... Uh, more interesting here. So let's come to the very large part, large part, last part of the sutta. And uh, then the Buddha basically just uh, repeats what he says at the beginning. The four kinds of mindful med meditation are the path to convergence. Yeah? They are the path to samadhi, literally. That's what that would mean. And then the kind of broader idea of Satipatthana, they are in order to purify sentient beings, to get past sorrow and crying, to make an end of pain and sadness, to end the cycle of suffering, and to realize extinguishment. That is what I said, and this is why I said it. So very powerful, very beautiful, very useful. That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what the Buddha had said. So there you are, the famous Satipatthana Sutta, expl explained not in great detail, but explained, I think, in sufficient detail for you to get a feeling for it. And uh, one of the main points that I have made when I've been going through the Satipatthana Sutta is that uh, what it really is about, it's really about samadhi practice. It's about how the mind achieves samadhi. It's about understanding the defilements of the mind, understanding the good qualities of mind, and then making progress by overcoming the bad qualities and actually uh, gaining the good qualities of mind. This is kind of the core message of the sutta. But you will see one of the things that is missing here, that what is missing in the sutta, and what is a kind of what we need to come to later on, it is missing, well, exactly how do we do this? What is the context for these practices? Yes, we have to observe feelings. Yes, we have to know the mind states. Yes, somehow we have to deal with the dhammas. We have to kind of develop the seven factors of awakening, overcoming the five hindrances. But exactly how it is done? Is there a larger context for this? Is there a specific meditation object that we should use to enable us to do this? And the answer, of course, is yes. And that answer is given somewhere else. It is given in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. And this is why I want to come to this Sutta next, because when we come to the mindfulness of breathing, we see that the context in how the satipatthanas are developed, how the satipatthanas are fulfilled, is actually the mindfulness of breathing. It gives us the framework, it gives us a skeleton on which this broader idea of satipatthana can be done. So satipatthana is more than mindfulness of breathing, but mindfulness of breathing is the main way that we apply the mind to achieve this progress in the Satipatthana. 
Satipatthana is a bit more because we have seen that it, it is also about the 31 parts of the body. It is also about gaining some degree of insight and understanding of how the mental processes actually work. But still, it comes back to the one main thing, and that is Anapanasati. And that is what we're going to talk about after lunch today. So let's, uh, before we do anything more, let's just do a little bit more, have another short break, and then we'll do a bit of Q&A before we head off for lunch.